Let's continue in an attitude of worship as we read out of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, your goodness is not lost on us. Many of us in this room have experienced the salvation that your blood brings. Um, and so we understand you to be a good God. Uh, and it's easy to remember that in good times. Uh, but Father, you are able uh, to use our ransomed life in any way that you choose. Uh, and that means even in prison for the furthering of the gospel. And so this morning, God, I pray that as we study in Ephesians, uh, God, that we would realize that uh, you are not uh, a God that spoils us and gives us whatever we wish. Uh, you are not committed to our happiness. You are committed to our greatness for your sake and for your glory. And so even in the hard times, uh, may we know your goodness, and may we know that you are going to glorify yourself through us. So God, teach us today uh, through the story of Paul. Uh, help us to understand how you can uh, use our lives, uh, however that may be. Uh, but God, may we be a committed people that is committed to allowing you to use our lives uh, to make much of yourself so that others might know you as we do. Uh, use the sermon to mo this morning uh, to speak to our hearts and to teach us that we might walk away different today. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. church. It is great to be here worshiping the Lord with you. It is great to pray the word, sing the word, and hear the word, isn't it? If you would, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Philippians. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. As you're turning there, I just have this uh, little truth that I want to pose to you this morning. And it's this, you can tell a lot about a person by what brings a person joy, what causes a person to celebrate. You can learn a lot about them, right? You can learn what's important to them, what, what's exciting to them, what they um, notice and celebrate, and what brings their life joy. Well, as you have your Bibles there at Philippians chapter 1, feel free, if you want to, to turn to Luke 15. I'll tell you just a, a short story, uh, a, a parable, right, uh, about a man who had two sons, you know the story by the prodigal son, right? And so a man had two sons, uh, an older and a younger. The younger uh, wanted to live on his own. Man, he wanted the dad dead. He wanted his inheritance. He wanted to go live it up. So that's what the younger son did. He went to his dad and he said, I want my share of the inheritance. The father gave him his share of the inheritance. And the younger son, it says, went and lived it up and squandered it in reckless living. He went to find joy and satisfaction in this world, right? He thought that this world would complete him and bring him joy. Well, the younger son found himself broke. A famine arose, and the younger son uh, decided that he would get a job, right? So he went and got a job, and he started feeding the pigs, and, and he longed, says he longed to be fed with the food, the pods that the pigs ate. Now listen, that's when it gets bad, isn't it? Right? 
Like, you're hopeless, you're away from family, no support, and you're longing to eat slop. (laughs) I, I can't imagine it getting much worse than that. He has this light bulb moment, right, where he said, my servants have plenty enough. My father's servants have plenty enough. And I'm going to go back. And so he goes back, and as he's, as he's walking back to the house, he's coming back to the house, could you see him? He, do, he doesn't have his shoulders at back. He's not puffing his chest out, right? But he comes back, and he's beaten. And it says the father saw him and ran to him. Ran to him, put the best robe on him, ring on his feet, killed the fatted calf, fattened calf, and threw a party. What was the response of the father? Celebrating. You can learn about that father. Well, not the father was mean or angry or bitter. He was excited. He was excited to see the son who was gone be reconciled back. So he celebrated. He threw this huge party, and the older brother, man, he heard the music and the dancing. You would think that the older brother would be excited, right? In Luke 15, that the, that the younger son came back. But the older brother was upset. He was mad. He was angry. Well, you learn a lot about people by how they celebrate and what they celebrate, don't you? Well, here in Philippians, Paul is rejoicing. Like this whole series is about finding joy in everything, and really it's finding joy in everything that's foundation is Christ. Finding joy in everything that's foundation is Christ. And so here Paul is in prison. He's been harassed. He's been falsely accused. He's been a part of a shipwreck. Like, man, and Paul's had a lot go on with his life, but he still rejoices. He still is celebrating. He's still excited when the world feels like it's kind of crashing around him. He's been threatened. He's been harassed. He's in prison. He's been a part of a shipwreck. Like all of these horrible things we we would define as horrible things has happened to him, but still Paul is rejoicing. We have to ask the question, why? Why, Paul, are you still rejoicing? Why are you still celebrating and let's look and and find out the reasons why Paul is rejoicing and celebrating well it says this in verse 12 I want you to know brothers that what has happened to me all those things the imprisoned harassed threatened shipwrecks false accusations all of those things that happen to Paul listen to what he says has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel So the first thing I want you to get is through Paul's imprisonment for Christ, God's mission is being accomplished. His mission, right? And so he says, I want you to know, brothers, that all that's happened to me has served to advance the gospel. God's mission is being accomplished. Verse 13, point two, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Point two, the gospel is spreading. The gospel is spreading. Point three, look at verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Point three is this. People are boldly proclaiming the gospel. And so hear this. All these things that happened to Paul, especially his imprisonment, created new opportunities. New opportunities for God's mission to be accomplished, the gospel to spread, and the people to boldly proclaim the gospel. The Roman government thought they could quiet Paul and this gospel movement. They thought they could do that, but Paul rejoices. He rejoices in truth that God's will will be accomplished. So no matter what's going on in his life, he rejoices. He celebrates because God's plan is unfolding. You see, Paul's imprisonment for Christ served to be an instrument that God used. An instrument that God used for non-Christians to become Christians and for nominal Christians to become courageous ones. For non-Christians to become Christians and for nominal Christians to become courageous ones. And so because of this, Paul's not complaining. Would you? If you're in prison, harassed, been a part of a shipwreck, 
threatened, and falsely accused, would you look for God to be working? Or would we complain? But Paul's not complaining. It says this in verse 18, What then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Not in my circumstance, not in my environment, but in that, that Christ is being proclaimed, I rejoice. I celebrate. He celebrates the foundation of his joy, which is Christ. And we as Christians are called to do the same. We find joy in God's work being accomplished. We find joy and we celebrate, we rejoice in the lost being saved. We rejoice in disciples being made. We rejoice in evangelism evangelism happening. We rejoice in children growing in the Lord. We rejoice in marriages displaying the gospel. And we rejoice in prayers being answered. We rejoice in these things. Why? Because they're about Christ. It's about Christ being proclaimed. And He is the foundation of our joy. And these prayers being answered, uh, every Monday we get together as staff, almost every Monday when we can, which is most of the time, we get together as a staff and we look over the sermon and we go over the next week's calendar and we look ahead a few months and we got people we want to reconnect with and we got all these things that we talk about, right? We talk about the previous sermon, we talk about the next sermon, we look at the sermon schedule, right? Like all these things we talk about every Monday. And at the end of our staff meeting, I will go around and I will just ask everyone how they're doing. And so we go one at a time. Everybody just tells me how they're doing. That They tell me things that they're rejoicing in. They tell me prayer requests. And, and then at the end, we spend time praying for those. Well, I'll never forget this one, right? We're going around the room, and, and uh, man, people are telling me their praises, what they're rejoicing in. It was toward the end of the year. And so right before Christmas or, or maybe right after Christmas, it, it was it about to be a new year. And I remember one, one of the people in our staff members said, uh, man, we just spent some time, I rejoiced. We spent some time as a family looking at our prayer board and just praising God for all the answered prayers throughout the year. Well, that intrigued me a little bit, right? And I was like, hey, man, flesh that out a little bit. Like, I want to know more about that. And he was like, all right, so we have a prayer board in our house, and we write down prayer requests all throughout the year. And at the end of the year, uh, we'll go back, and, and we'll talk about the dates God answered those prayers. And they just spend time reflecting and rejoicing in all the answered prayers that God answered throughout the year. That's what it looks like to celebrate, church. To celebrate God working. To celebrate God moving. To celebrate God's faithfulness. To celebrate the people that's been saved. The people that's been discipled. The marriages that's been helped. The children that's growing in the Lord. That's what it looks like. And that should be what motivates. That should be what brings joy in the life of Christians. Is when Christ is being proclaimed. And this is what we're seeing in Paul. He rejoices in Christ being proclaimed, not his circumstance or his environment, but in Christ. And that should be true of us as well. And so, man, I grabbed hold of that nugget and I stole it. Right? I was like, man, I'm doing that. Because, man, that is so good. That is so good to have a reminder of what Christ is doing in his faithfulness and how his mission is coming true. We get to be a part of it. And so Paul here in prison Man, he, he's not in a cush prison, but he still rejoices. He's not in an ideal situation, but he rejoices. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the foundation of his joy. And in the heart of transparency this morning, I think we're oftentimes like the younger son. I think oftentimes we are like the younger son. You say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? We really believe that this world will bring us joy. Just like that younger prodigal son, right? He went to this world thinking there's something greater out there. There's something greater out there, greater than the father, greater than the king. There's something greater. I know you say, you say well, 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 Pastor, the, the father in that parable wasn't the king. Well, don't miss this. That's about God. <laughs> okay? Don't miss that. And so sometimes we feel that way, right? We, we think that there's something greater out there. We think that 
We can find joy in favorable circumstances or in mountaintop days or in success or wealth. We think that's going to bring us joy. Then why is it the people with all the success and all the wealth are not joyful? Then why is that? Why are they looking to supplements and other things if that brought them joy? Why? Because there's nothing in this world that will bring us joy and satisfaction apart from the foundation of our joy, which is Christ. That's it. But so often we think that our joy will only happen in success or mountaintop days, favorable circumstances. But Paul's teaching us something different. Even though we may seek good days, and good days are not a bad thing. I like good days, don't you? And I like favorable circumstances. Even though, man, we appreciate those things. True joy is found in being part of God's plan and His work. It's being a part of something bigger than ourselves. That's where true joy comes from. So maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, that, that seems hard. My work environment's rough. Well, look for the ways that God may be working. Look for, look for the reasons God may have you in that hard environment with that tough neighbor, that tough coworker. Why, why, why does God have you in that environment? Are they a way for God to be glorified? Or can you still find joy in being used by God in that moment, in that circumstance, in that environment? Because Paul could have been like, well, I can't do anything. I'm supposed to be out there on the front lines. Man, I haven't even got to visit the church at Philippi. Like, God, why do you have me in here? But no, man. And Paul's looking for the reason God has him in there, and he's rejoicing in it. And maybe that's true for you this morning. But you need to see the reason God has you where he has you. And rejoice that you get to be a part of God's plan and part of God's work. That you get to be used by him for his glory. See, Paul is looking for God's plan. He's looking for God to work, even in hard times. He's looking to be used by God, even though it's not an ideal circumstance for him. He's still looking to be used by God. And that's why this sermon series is not titled Having Joy, but it's Finding Joy. We can find joy in every circumstance, in every environment, in every hardship, in every ideal situation or non-ideal situation. We can still find joy because our joy is not anchored to the circumstance, it's anchored to Christ. So we still find joy. We find joy in everything that is centered on Jesus. Everything. When I was uh, 19 years old, I used to, I became a believer, right, in my teenage years. At 19 years old, I, I got an opportunity to go to prayer meetings, right? There was a prayer meeting, and, and, um, and so I got the opportunity, it was on Monday nights, and I would go, and I would listen to these older, older men, and sometimes women, right? They would just share their story, they would share their testimony. Some of them would just say, I thank the Lord for being saved. But every so often, there would be somebody that gets up, and they would share their story, they would share their testimony. Right? Testimony sharing is, is, is very fruitful and it's very encouraging to believers, right? As long as it's centered on Christ. And, and, and so, man, people would, would get up and they would, they would share their story. Well, I'll never forget this one. I was 19. A uh, 75-year-old man stood up. He was weeping. And he said, uh, 30 years ago, it may have been that week or that day, that month, whatever he said, but 30 years ago, he said, I was 45. He said, I was sitting on my couch, and I thought, man, today's the day I'm going to take my life. He said, I was by myself, I had the gun sitting right there beside of me, and I was contemplating, would today be the day that I ended it all? And he said, if I'm really being honest, it probably was. It probably was going to be the day. And all of a sudden, there was a knock on the door, and he said, I got up, and there was a man there. And the man said, hey, do you want hope? He said, yeah, I would love to have hope. And he said, well, it's found in Jesus. Can I tell you about him? He said, yeah, he invited the man in. And he said, they talked, and they bowed down right there in that living room, beside that couch, beside that gun, and he followed Christ 30 years. For 30 years, he'd been following the Lord. 
And that same God, the God that he promised would give him hope at age 45 in the darkest of days, the same God that was giving him hope at 75 at a Monday night prayer meeting. Because our hope is anchored, our peace, our joy is anchored in knowing the King. Knowing him. Now some people may ask, well pastor, what was the name of the man that, that led him to the Lord? And that's where you need to get it. And this is where Paul's teaching us something. The joy is not found in being known. Not found in being known. The joy is found in being used. That's what Paul's showing us here. It wasn't Paul that was in the, in the city and in the towns and in the synagogues. It wasn't him teaching at that moment. It was him in prison, praising the Lord that the Lord's plan was still happening. He was sharing the gospel, even the imperial guard. He was rejoicing and celebrating in prison, and people were encouraged by that. It was him being faithful in the circumstance that he was in. So it's not always about being known. It's just about being used. If you want joy in your life, man, that's found in being a part of something bigger than you. Bigger than your circumstance, bigger than your wealth, bigger than your success. It's being a part of God's kingdom and God's plan. It's being an instrument of usefulness in his hand. If you want joy... Joy is found in knowing Jesus. So if you're lost this morning and you don't know Jesus and you want hope, it's found in Jesus. Hear the testimony of a 75-year-old man, right, talking about his hope found in Jesus. You want joy? It's found in knowing him. Number two, it's found in being a part of his church, using your gifts for building up his kingdom. And thirdly, it's being used by him no matter what circumstance you're in. It's being used by him. You want joy? It's found in Christ. If you'd like to talk with me about it, I'm up here. If you'd like to come to know Christ, I'm up here to talk to you. If you want to just come and pray and say, man, Pastor, or, or God, I'm, I'm in a non-ideal situation, right? This is not very ideal, but I want to be used by you. And pray, and ask God to show you how you can. All right? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Uh, thank you that you are a God who uh, gives us life, gives us joy, gives us reconciliation and peace. So, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters all over this room that they will find joy that is founded, that is centered on knowing you. I pray for anyone here that's lost that they will come to know you. And, Father, I pray that we will be people who are faithful, who are used by you, and who glorify your name. So God, I pray that you'll move among us. Help people come and pray and praise you and sing to you and find joy in knowing you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.